We are continuing our sermon series, Tell Me a Story, and we're looking at uh, some key stories in Scripture. Uh, and these stories move us along uh, God's uh, larger story from Genesis to Revelation, but also um, what he's still doing today. Uh, and we are a part of that story. And so we're going to look at uh, a very interesting story from Genesis 24. Uh, the whole chapter is really long, so we're not going to read the whole chapter. Um, the, uh, the scripture is on the back of your sermon notes, or you can follow along here on the wall, or your Bible app, or Bibles you brought with you, or the Bibles in the pews. And we're going to read verses 1 through 4, and then verse 10, and then 12 through 20, and then 66 to 67. So here we go. Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. And that's just an ancient way that you made an oath to people back then. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. You'd be having no Canaanites in my family. Among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives or my own people group, my own tribe, my own clan, and get a wife for my son Isaac. So Abraham's looking for a son, looking for uh, a wife for his son Isaac. Then um, verse uh, 10, then the servant left, taking with him 10 of his master's camels loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram, Naharam, and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camp, sorry, Nahor. Then down, we're going to skip over to uh, verse 12. Then he prayed, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one who, who let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too, until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all the camels. You remember how many camels he brought? Ten camels. You know how much water camels drink? Rebecca is in good shape. She could run in the Paris Olympics at this point. Then verses 66 and 67. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her, Rebekah, into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah, so she became his wife and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after, was comforted after his mother's death. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, it's Father's Day, so you know what that means, dad jokes. That's right, but before we get to the dad jokes, I want you to know that when we would meet every two or three weeks as a building committee, Cole would uh, attend some of those meetings along with John Huco. 
And for some reason, the committee decided that they wanted to bring up my fantastic jokes that I would tell in a sermon every once in a while. And they became very intrigued by these jokes. So before I get to a dad jokes, I'm going to tell a contractor joke and an architect joke. And Cole, I got to tell you, I, I, I went searching and searching for a really good contractor joke but it's so strange, I ran out of material. <laughs> yeah, that's right, baby. Come on, Cole. So, John, you've heard of Big Ben? You know Big Ben in London? Everybody has heard of Big Ben? John, do you know the architects that, that designed Big Ben? No, you don't, but I do, John. I do. Two architects, John, Charles Barry and Augustus Pugin. Oh, I love that name, Augustus. Uh, but I don't know if you knew this, John, but the, the drawings were so complex that it took the builders 13 years to build Big Ben, which is so strange to me because I'm told that they were working around the clock. That's, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Did you hear about the wife who left a note on the fridge door saying, this isn't working? I'm not really sure what she meant. I opened the fridge door and it was working fine. Okay, one more. At this point, John Cole, usually they start clapping. I don't know. It must be Father's Day, so they're taking... No. And just as an example of how skilled I am at both entertaining you and assisting you in becoming biblically smarter, this next joke just isn't funny. It relates to our passage this morning. What did the flame tell his parents when he fell in love? I found the perfect match. <laughs> See, I found the perfect match, and then the story. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. You know, today's story is very appropriate, right? It's Father's Day, and we have a father, Abraham, who wants to make sure his son, Isaac, marries well. But Abraham just isn't concerned about Isaac marrying well because he wants to have a good daughter-in-law, right? Abraham knows that he is responsible for who his son marries and making sure that his lineage remains in line with what God has in mind for his family. This promise is referred to as the Abrahamic Covenant. And this covenant is made between God and Abraham. And it has two main parts. The first one is the promise of land, blessing, and descendants. That's back in Genesis 11. And the second one is that redemption of humanity would come from this family tree. So we've got a promise of land and blessing and descendants, and we have redemption that will come from this family tree. And that is why Abraham is so adamant that Isaac does not marry a Canaanite and he marries from his own people. Therefore, what does Abraham do? Well, he takes steps to make sure this happens. And it is those steps I want us to focus on this morning. And the focus of those steps centers around this senior servant character. We're never told this person's name in our passage. There's some guesses about who it is. But he plays a key role. And this story is one of many examples of God guiding or using ordinary people to work out his purpose and plan. God will not allow this family tree to be cut down. There is too much at stake. And so what about this servant? Well, three ideas. The servant's promise... God's plan and promise, and then the servant's obedience, obedience and success. 
So first, the servant's promise. Notice that the servant's promise is not so much to Abraham as it is to God. I want you to swear to by the Lord, the God of heavens and the God of earth. This servant makes two critical promises. One to Abraham, but first to God. You know, it's one thing for us to make a promise to another per person or to make a promise even to oneself. But it's quite another to make a promise to God. You know, last week in the story of Noah, Andy brought up the idea that God is not absent what, from what happens here on earth. That God notices as creatures made in his image how we talk to each other, behave towards each other, and behave towards God. And we see this again here. God is watching, and I'm pretty sure he hears this promise from this senior servant. Abraham well understands the seriousness of this ask, but nowhere near close in comparison to how God understands this promise. As Noah can be seen as a faith hero figure, in his obedience in building the ark, this servant can be seen as a faith hero figure by keeping his promise. And God still calls faithful servants today. God still calls faithful servant churches today. You know, today we are celebrating the commissioning of new members um, at our 9.45 and 11.30 service. And we ask them questions of faithfulness. We ask them to make promises to God, to themselves, to his church, and to this church. And we make promises to them. A Christian makes promises to God in response to the promise God has already made to us the promise of his son. The son makes a promise to the father and the spirit to give up his life for the people whom God has called unto himself. This promise by the son is known as the covenant of redemption. And it is made in eternity. Before anything was created. Before the foundations of the earth. The son makes a promise to the father and the spirit. And this promise, this covenant, takes into account the fall of humanity, which Andy explored with us a couple of Sundays ago. And to keep that promise, that covenant, requires the most costly and precious of sacrifices by the Son. Jesus keeps the promise, Adam, Eve, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and everyone who followed could not keep. That is to live a life in a perfect obedience to God's law. And that is why in the New Testament, God is referred to as the second Adam or the true Israel. Because Jesus accomplishes what neither Adam nor Israel could accomplish. Now friends, one of the most honorable and powerful witnesses of the gospel to others can be when they see us keeping our promises. Promises not just between two people, but the promises we make with God. Promises to live a certain way, behave a certain way, even when it would be much easier to go with the flow, not cause any waves, give in just a little. Second point, God's plan and purpose. And we find this in the second half of verse 8, which we did not read. I will give this land... He will send his, what? Angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. You know, this reminds me of one of the best Christian pickup lines ever. I can't believe how amazing you are. I didn't know angels flew this low. Aw, so sweet. Abraham and his servant have a plan, but God is already ahead of them. Uh, I'm sure I've shared with you before, uh, the first time I went to Malawi, I, I had 
so many more questions than answers. I had way more anxious moments than firm and stable assurances and faith. But I had some good friends, and especially my friend Davidson in Malawi, who reminded me that God always goes ahead of us. God is already there. He's already working. He's already preparing. The most important thing I provide is faith in who God is. Not in who I am, but in who God is. When God makes a promise, faith is the currency that purchases it. When God makes a promise, faith is the currency that purchases it. Finally, third point, the servant's obedience and success. To this previous point about our faith currency, please, faith isn't the only currency. Look at the servant in this story. He does several really smart things. Here they are. Here's a few of them. He takes 10 camels loaded with lots of goodies. Right? He takes the camels to the well at the appropriate time he knew women would be there. He prays. Then he keeps watch and then springs into action at the appropriate time. He also recognizes how God has answered his prayer. Rebecca shows up. Next, he springs into action a second time and gets Rebecca's attention. And then finally, he kept watch so as to make sure he got it right. This is an amazing servant. This servant isn't just spiritual, he's savvy, he's smart. He has a plan. He reads the room, as it were. Or in this case, the well. And while he's praying, he's watching. He's ready to move on a second's notice. And when that moment hits, he's prepared beforehand to leap into action. You know, friends, if you want to climb Mount Everest, (laughs) if you want to graduate, If you want to start or run a business, get married, have meaningful relationships, if you want to start the process and then carry through on building a new children's courtyard, praying is a really good idea. But you know what else is a really good idea? Especially if you are the pastor, moi, overseeing the project, who knows about as much about building a children's courtyard as he does about climbing Mount Everest, you plan and prepare well. You get a good committee. And you get a really good chair who is detailed-oriented on that committee, Dusty Johnson. You get people who have a personal and ministry stake in making sure this goes well and meets their needs, Kathy and Carla. You find people in the church who have experience in architecture, design, and construction, and then hire a skilled and easy-to-work-with architect and contractor. And then after all that, you keep praying. (laughs) You just keep praying. In other words, you get a bunch of camels, you load them up for what will most likely be a wild and crazy adventure with some unexpected delays and issues. Now, I'm not comparing our committee to a bunch of camels. Well, maybe a little. That's okay. We are told at the end of this chapter, this servant's efforts are rewarded with success. The servant told Isaac all he had done, and Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother's tent, and he married Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Can we all say, oh? You know, that, you know, when you read through the whole Bible, every once in a while you'll find a Disney ending. And not often, but every once in a while you will. And, and this, is, this is one of them. This is kind of a Disney ending. 
Friends, who do you go to to get water when you need to be refreshed? And please, I know that Jesus provides living water in our lives. But in our story, the angel doesn't go get the water. <laughs> the angel doesn't go and talk to Rebecca. It's the servant. God puts people in our lives to bring us refreshment. And so who are the people in your life that God uses to refresh you? Are you in need of some? If you are, I would encourage you to ask. They're probably already at the well. On the other hand, maybe you know someone who needs some water. And to be really practical, not sure if you've noticed, but it's a bit toasty outside lately, isn't it? Maybe you can buy someone a cold bottle of water. Maybe you know someone whose life is going through a dry spell, who needs some refreshment. How might you fill a bucket of encouragement, a bucket of presence, kindness, and care, and offer some relief? God calls each of us to gather our camels, head to the well, and spring into action, knowing that he is kept, he is promised to us through Jesus, who has promised us the kind of water that will never run out and will give us eternal life. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and we thank you for this incredible story of incredible lessons of how you go before us, the promises that you keep to us. Lord, may we keep the promises that we make to you. And Lord, may, may we be that servant to others. May we be Rebecca to others who, who draws water and brings refreshment. And Lord, I pray for those who may need refreshment today. We pray, Lord, for those who are searching for places to cool off in this incredible heat and to find some water. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.